Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session of Get, G Get Digital. My name is Brian Harney. I'm Professor of Strategy and HR here in DCU Business School. Um, so throughout the week, Get Digital have explored a range of topics related to business, leadership, entrepreneurship, and with a particular focus on how um, organizations of all sizes can, can harness the potential of transformative digital technologies to achieve their, their business goals. Um, so in that spirit and turning to this session, we are really pleased to have Josh Holmes here. Josh is Development Lead and Evangelist, a great title, at Microsoft. And he'll be talking to us about technical leadership, putting the technical leadership back into digital business. So a really, really interesting topic. And we're really looking forward to hearing Josh speak. Um, we do encourage um, participant engagement. The chat function is disabled, but what we do have is a Q&A function up and running. So please make sure to pop your questions into the q and I'll collate them. And when Josh has finished speaking, I'll have the opportunity then um, to, to field some of your questions and, and he'll take some of your questions. Um, so thanks very much to Josh. Thanks to everyone involved. Um, and with no further delay, I'll pass you over to Josh for his session. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, that is me in the uh, little picture there with my Linster jersey on. Um, I know some of you uh, because I, I used to live in Ireland. I, I lived in Dublin. Um, I worked for Microsoft uh, from, uh, well, I still work at Microsoft. I've worked at Microsoft almost 15 years. But three of those years, um, kind of uh, end of 2010 to early 2013, I was based in um, uh, the Sandy Ford Business Park and uh, ended up up at uh, you know the, the, a lot of the local technical events and so on as I was the local technical evangelist um, for, um, for Microsoft. Um, so, uh, but let me jump on into my presentation. And where are we at? There we are. I'm going to share this here. Oops, let me go back to here. Technical leadership. Um, so this is this is a, a, a leadership talk, right? It's about leadership, it's about management, it's about um, you know the the um, uh, basics of being a strong technical leader, um, and the reality is, um, you know, as I was thinking about this, and I was I was working with uh, Theo Lynn um, on the on the topic, et cetera. Um, you know, I started thinking about all the digital tools. I started thinking about um, all the other things that you know we could uh, bring to bear, and the uh, the reality is that. Uh, I, I, I kept coming back around to, there are a lot of digital tools that can help us and uh, so on, but the reality is they're crutches. They are there to help you overcome poor management and poor leadership. And so this talk is actually gonna really, really focus on what it means to be a strong leader and what it means to be a strong uh, manager in this digital world. Um, you know, regardless of whether you're in a digital world or not, but we're going to talk about that as far as, far as how this is going to apply to your technical organization, how it applies to your team, how it applies to you, um, and so on. So, um, number one is only three things happen naturally in an organization, friction, confusion, and underperformance. Everything else requires leadership. Leadership is a uh, strong and overpowered word, uh, but this is from Peter Drucker, um, absolutely great quote. Uh, if you look at any organization, whether that is a, you know, a, a, a kid's play group or that is a multinational, you know, Fortune 10 company, great leadership is what overcomes that friction and confusion and underperformance. Um, and so, you know, when you're thinking about these um you know the, the you know the the an organization most of the time this is how we think about our organizations you know where it is a top down structure you know with our leaders at the top and they're managing other leaders and then down at the bottom we've got our worker bees who are you know actually doing the real work because all of this stuff flows downhill the reality is a little more complicated this is this is actually 
real organizations. And, you know, when you think about an organization, um, you know, the lines of communication, the lines of uh, clarity that need to be provided, um, the more complex it is, the, the, the more you're going to need leadership. When you're talking about this type of a very hierarchical um, uh, organization, you don't need leadership for that. You need management. And that management is going to flow downhill and um the you know and that and that is um you know but it doesn't produce a strongly performing uh company that is going to really have an impact in a digital world this this type of an organization is very very good for um doing um factory development and you know those types of things but it's not really good for um you know really having innovation and uh and such that's where you need much more collaboration you need a a more loosely defined management structure and a stronger leadership structure okay so first let's talk about some myths about leaders and leadership um the first big myth about leaders uh, is that your manager is your leader Okay, um, how many of you have a boss and you look at that boss and you go, you know, I could do their job. Well, if you're not doing that, then you should be doing that, right? But how many of you look around your team and go, wow, that person is the person I go to for help. That person is the person that is setting the direction of our team, of our organization, um, who is working with our clients, et cetera. Well, this is because your company will pick your manager, but your team is going to pick your leaders. Sometimes, every once in a while, every once in that blue moon, you were lucky enough that that is the same person. So this is a quote from Denny Williford, who was one of my very first technical mentors um, in, the tech, in, in the industry, and it was great. Uh, MD Arnold's, a good leader leads people from above them. I heard somebody phrase it this way. They said, um, it's really amazing um, that you work with all these people and you don't lord power over them. That was a really interesting turn of phrase, lording power over somebody, right? So that's leading from above. A great leader leads people from within them. And so that is, as you look to your right and your left and you look at your peers, um, who are the people that are setting direction, that are setting tone, that are setting culture? Those are your leaders, right? So the one who gets the credit is the leader. It's also false, okay? So unless you think this is going to be your last idea ever, don't worry about the credit. That credit will come around and people will get to know you. You know, your management chain may not give you credit for this particular idea, but the people on the team know who that idea came from. And they're going to continue to look to you for leadership. And as you do that, that you know is going to build your brand and build your leadership and flex those muscles. And so I, especially as a manager, but just as an individual in a team, I will always always take blame anything goes wrong it's my fault it's my failing anything that goes right i make sure that i'm casting that praise onto the people around me who assisted who helped who led that initiative whatever their involvement was i make sure they're getting credit for it because giving credit and taking blame that's what leaders do okay there can only be one leader I hope you have already um, gathered from this talk that you can have more than one leader, right? So if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, and do more, and become more, you are a leader. John Quincy Adams. Turns out he was a smart, fairly smart fellow, okay? You should make your best people managers, right? Um, so this is the Peter principle. You might have heard it before. The, the principle that members of a hierarchy are promoted until they reach a level at which they are no longer competent. I've seen this many, many, many times. Okay. In fact, I've seen this uh, recently. Um, there's a fellow in, um, in, in, in my larger group who was an absolutely fantastic 
individual contributor because when the you know when when we got behind on a project he would just put his head down and he would go crank out a tremendous amount of high quality code he was peer reviewing other people's code he was um, pairing with them he was helping but he got really deep in the weeds that's fantastic then they made him a manager and the problem is that taking that thing that made him a great individual contributor and now making him a manager he took all that with him and now he is a micro manager which is not what i want to work for i, I want to work for somebody who sets a inspirational direction and sends me on my way and checks in to make sure i'm making progress but he got peter principled he got promoted promoted that's another myth, actually, that I should just go ahead and add that to the deck. There is a myth that becoming a manager is a promotion. It's not a promotion. It is a different type of work. Okay. And so when, when you shift from being an individual contributor to being a manager, now it is not your delivery that matters. It is now the team's delivery and how you are helping them, how you are assisting them, how you are enabling them how you're picking the work that this individual is going to end up doing or that individual is going to end up doing that is just outside of their comfort zone so it helps them grow and stretch in the directions that they need to grow and stretch whether or not it's uncomfortable for them that's really what being a good manager is and it's not getting down into the weeds and becoming a micromanager and uh and so on and so Oftentimes, people who are really good at one level are promoted to another level, and it hurts them. Leadership is easy to learn. Sadly, also false. Okay, so let you digest this for a minute. Reading a great book, book uh, a great management book about the rules of leadership. Dilbert here. Allow me to put that in context. There are probably 10,000 books on leadership. Um, and uh, there are two million uh, real leaders, no two of which are alike. Moreover, every situation is unique and requires a different type of leadership. And yet, this one author has found a magic formula to transform you from a global balloon in, a buffoon into, or bab baboon, sorry, into a great leader. And that makes sense because all the great leaders in history achieve success by reading a random book. Manager, I don't like context. The Dilbert, it isn't popular. <laughs> and that is true. Context is not popular sometimes when it casts things on the um, on, on, on the truth here. So uh, you will learn leadership from this talk. Also, sadly, very, very false. Um, instead, here, I'm just going to break down some of the myths and help you recognize the differences between leaders and managers. One more myth here for you. There's only one way to lead people. The reality is leadership is not the work of a single person. Rather, it can be explained and defined as a collaborative endeavor among group members. Therefore, the essence of leadership is not the, uh, is, is not uh, the leader, but the relationship. Now, I want you to think about that just for a moment, because what that tells you is that every single team is going to require a different type of leadership, right? Every single situation is going to require a different type of leadership. And so sometimes you're going to need to be authoritarian. Sometimes you're going to need to be collaborative. Sometimes you're going to need to be uh, dictatorial. Sometimes, you know, like there's a whole bunch of different management philosophies. And you know, just like when I'm working, you know, with a youth group or working with my kids or working with my team, it, it doesn't matter. Every single situation, I'm going to look at it and say, okay, who's here? What do they need in this moment? What style and how can I provide what they need in this moment in order to get them over this hurdle and really set them on that larger and more inspirational path? All right. So, talked a little bit about some of the myths, but let's talk about one of the manager's most difficult problems, and that is hiring. 
Okay. And so hiring is, is um, one of the most difficult and one of the most um, important things that a manager does is hiring and making sure that we're getting the right team in place in order to uh, really affect what we're doing here. And so um, diversity and inclusion is a huge portion, portion of the things that I focus on very heavily. And the reason is because, I mean, it takes a tremendous amount of effort. Um, you know, diversity and inclusion, um, hiring the right people. Um, if, if I'm actually, I am currently looking for a principal level developer to join my team and help lead projects and so on. And so I'm looking for a lot of leadership qualities in this person. And it would be really, really easy for me to uh, go, go hire out of the first handful of people that I end up getting. And because uh, there's some great candidates that are coming in. Um, however, the ones that are coming in first, very predictably, are, um, are middle-aged white males. Like that, like hopefully that's not shocking to anybody here. Um, and so uh, one of the things, the, 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 the uh, things that Microsoft, um, you know, sets as a bar in our diversity um, rules around hiring is that any principal level position and up, what we do is we require that there is a diverse slate of people who are um, uh, going to be interviewed for the job. Okay. And I champion this rule. Um, so what it means is that we need to have a diverse slate of people, both gender diverse and racially diverse people to interview for the job. It does not mean that we're going to go hire those people. It means that we're going to get five to eight candidates and we need in there a mix of races and genders and um, that way we're at least having the conversation with them and then we go hire the best candidate from that pool. Right, but we're not going to take the five white males that applied first and go interview and hire the best of those. We're going to wait and we're going to push hard and we're going to recruit and we're going to go spend that extra time to go get those diverse candidates. Now, why is that? Why is that? And this line here, it pays off, right? Um, some people think it's because it's politically correct to go create a, uh, you know, to go, go, go down, down the diversity route. That's not why I value diversity on my team. Um, the reason that I value diversity on the team is that I have a lot of ideas. I have a tremendous number of ideas. I have no idea if they're any good or not. And if everybody else on the team thinks like me, they don't have any idea if they're any good or not either. So what I need, desperately need and crave on my team is I need people who will push back, who will ask that next question, who will say, what are you thinking, Josh? I, I don't understand, right? And so I need those people to pressure cook that idea. And once they pressure cook that idea, we can make sure that we're really interrogating it. We are really pushing that idea around and making sure that it, it, that it works for everybody on the team and if it does, then it's a good idea. Until then, it's just one of Josh's crazy harebrained ideas. And so uh, we can probably ignore it. But by getting a diverse group of people to come together and attack every single problem with vigor, and this is where the, the inclusion portion of this matters, because it doesn't matter if you hire diverse candidates if you don't listen to them. And so I want those, the, the, the people, every single person on my team, I want their opinions, I want their ideas, I want them to know that this is a safe place um, from, a, from a psychological standpoint where they can shoot down my ideas or anybody's ideas on the team, they can propose new ideas, and they're okay with those ideas being shot down, All right? Strong opinions loosely held. And a diverse group of people to challenge every single idea, that's my, that's my goal. That's my dream, right? And so when I talk about diverse, what does that mean? Well, there's visible diversity, and then there's all of these other things, right? And so um, if I look at 
uh, the personality, right? That person that's in the middle right there. Um, who is that person? There's some things that are inherent to that person, right? Things that they can't necessarily change about themselves, right? Um, where were they born, right? Who are their parents? Um, you know, what skin color they have. Uh, there are things that they can't really change about themselves. These are things that are inherent to them. And a lot of these things not only help shape them, but also shape how people perceive them, right? And that transference, as you think about how people uh, uh, perceive somebody else, that is a, uh, an intense portion of how personalities are formed, right? And then we get beyond that to cultural. Right. And so, you know, thinking about uh, cultural, were, you know, was somebody raised, you know, in the heart of Dublin? Is that that's going to be quite different than somebody who was raised out in Connemara? Right. Uh, it's going to be somebody, you know, quite different from somebody who was raised in the you know, West Carries or uh, over in the United States. Um, have they had a bunch of travel? Have they, um, you know, like where were they born? Where were they raised? Who was around them? All of those cultural things around them. Then you get into organization, right? So organizational, some of these blur the lines between, between organization and culture, but um, were they raised in the church, right? Do they have a strong faith life as part of that? Were they ever in the military? Um, you know, in your organization right now, uh, are you a, you know, are you a, are you a worker bee? Are you a manager? Are you, you know, have you been there 30 years? Um, are you an intern? You know, where are you in the organization? How big of an organization is it? How, do that, how does that organization treat people, right? Behavioral. Um, some people are just jerks, right? And that's, that, this is the way that it is. But all of these things add up to who is that person, right? And the thing that is just crushing me in this industry is um, I want to look at organizational. Um, what college does somebody go to? Right. Um, did they have Professor Brian Harney here as one of their professors? And, you know, if if, if they end up with, uh, you know, 10 people on the same team, all of whom went through Brian's exact same course, they're all going to think about the problems that you're solving in the same way. And that may be a great way because Brian's a great professor. But they're not going to challenge once you fit into that group. Right, so I want people who have taken classes from a lot of different professors in order to really spread that knowledge around and challenge it from different ideas and bring different ideas to the table because turns out if you do that, one plus one is more than two, right? It makes that idea that much stronger, right? But I'm having a hard time in this industry right now looking at organizational or looking at cultural as part of my hiring, because we as an industry have not been able to get past the inherent, right? We look at the disparities between men and women in the technical fields. We look at the disparities amongst the races in the fields, uh, in, in, in the technical fields. And it is, it, it just breaks my heart. And I pray for a day that I no longer have to make this a core part of every leadership talk that I do, talking about diversity and inclusion, because I pray for a day when the inherent is no longer the problem, but the you know we're able to get beyond that and start thinking about cultural and organizational, and you know and, and get outside of that inherent bubble. Um, so, diversity inclusion incredibly important, and it does pay off. It really, really, really does. All right, taking a breath. So coming back to your company, what is your company's mission, right? And this is where if we were in person, I would go around the auditorium and I would ask, what's your company's mission? Do you know your company's mission? Um, usually, if I have an auditorium of, let's say, 100 people or 1,000 people, it doesn't really matter, I'll have a, about 10% of the audience will actually know what their company's mission is, all right? And then if they know what their company's mission, a percentage of that group actually knows the answers to the next questions, okay? And so an example of this, Microsoft's original was to, um, or, or our previous one, was to put a PC in every home on the planet. And we, we, got, we 
they're really close. Like, and in fact, most companies or most people have more than one. In fact, I'm looking around the room here. I'm at my sister's house right now, helping take care of her kids. And I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm counting seven computers that I can see from where I'm sitting in the dining room. <laughs> and I know that we're that downstairs. There's a whole bunch more. Right. So. Um, but what's our what's our mission now? Right. And so our mission now is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. Boom! To enable every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. Wow. That, that's a mission that I can get out of bed for, right? That's a mission that when I get up in the morning, I'm excited to come to work because I know that I'm going to be helping enable people and organizations around the planet to achieve more, right? So what's your company's mission? Do you know what it is, right? And then very importantly, so to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Is that a mission you can believe in? Your company's uh, mission, is it, is it something you can believe in? How does your team contribute to that mission? Right, and so the team that I'm on um, is is commercial software engineering, and what we do is we partner with companies and we we pair program with them hand in hand and help them achieve their greatest innovations. We are an investment in our um, customers' success. Our organization came out of this mission statement. Right, this mission statement. This is the most direct way that we can help empower every organization on the planet to achieve more is because we actually go sit with them and pair program with them to help them achieve more right and so that is how my team contributes to that i know how i contribute to that in leading my team and making sure that we are customer focused that we are focused on what the customer needs at all times Right? This is not about what Microsoft needs, it's about what the customer needs. And so I know that and I lead my team and I hold that North Star very, very dearly. Right? I communicate that down to my team every day. Right? We are constantly looking at the requirements for the, for the project that we're working on and constantly saying, okay, so we're working with this company, um, you know, so-and-so at this company, um, they need to be able to do X, Y, Z. How are, is what we're doing today going to help them achieve that? And if we can do that every single day on every single story in our backlog, then we're doing the right things. If it doesn't fit into that, then it's serving us, not serving our customer. And so we're no longer on mission. We're now serving the wrong group, right? How do you communicate that up, right? And so as I'm working on every single one of my uh, projects, I'm constantly in conversations with my management chain and talking to them about how we're enabling. And, you know, I talk about specific people on my team to make sure they are receiving credit. And anytime we're off mission, I'm making sure I'm taking that blame, right? And so that's how I'm communicating up and how I'm communicating down. And so always, always, we are reinforcing that message and, the, and the, that North Star to our team, to our individuals, um, and to our organization, right? And so we're, I'm in lockstep with my leadership and my management as we are constantly, you know, talking about our mission and making sure that every action that we take is on mission, right? Headed towards that North Star. And for that, we set SMART goals, specific measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Okay, so specific. Get in shape. For years, I wanted to get in shape. Nothing changed until I got very specific and said, I'm going to join a gym and go three times a week. All right? First three weeks, month that I was there, I literally showed up at the gym. I went in, I changed clothes, I walked over, I looked at the weights, I picked one up, I put it back down, and I left, but I went three times a week, right? Eventually over time, that worked out into a much, much stronger workout program and uh, so on. Lose weight. Nope, that didn't help me at all. 
when I got very specific about I'm going to do this diet and I'm going to do it for X number of, of uh, months and I'm going to, you know, set these targets and, you know, we're going to track on this progress, being very, very specific about it really helps. Measurable. This is one of the things that I, you know, push a lot of my customers on all the time is are the things that we are doing, are they measurable, right? Do we know that we're headed in the right direction? And the answer to a lot of this is, yes, it is measurable. You just haven't thought about how to measure it, right? And so, um, you know, are they attainable? Do we have the skills? Do we have the abilities? Um, you know, and, and, you know, are we, do we have the, the capability to achieve the goal. And, uh, and that's actually where my team comes in quite a bit as we're going and working with these customers is we take somebody, take an organization who doesn't have the skills and abilities and we help them by teaching and coaching and, and working with them. Um, are they realistic, right? And so right on the edge of realistic, high goals drive action, low goals drive lethargy. So if you're gonna lose one pound in the next year, are you gonna diet? Probably not. Um, sorry, one pound, half a kilo, um, roughly. Uh, so what if I said, um, I need to lose 15 kilo over the next year? Okay. Well, that's probably too far out there and too big a goal. What if I said, I'm going to lose five kilo in the next six weeks, All right? Okay. Well, that's a high goal, but it's probably achievable if if I go back and I say, well, what is my measurable, right? And what is my specific that is going to be headed towards this attainable goal um, and realistic goal and then timely? Um, if I just say I'm going to lose uh, 10 kilo, but I don't put a timeline on it, okay, I don't know when that's going to happen. But if I say I need to lose 10 kilo in the next X number of months, what are my intermediate steps and targets that are going to help me get online? Um, that is very, very, very important. And so putting these together, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely, smart goals. Okay. Um, last thing, and this is my kind of philosophy on life, <laughs> um, is, you know, I look at this, this triangle and a lot of people look at the iron triangle here and they say, um, you know, I am going to pick something that uh, pays well and I am passionate about. And, and I would love to pick this line over here, um, pays well and I am passionate about it. But really, unless you're a Kardashian, you probably don't get to pick that line. I have a tremendous amount of passion around English Premier League soccer. And it pays really well, it turns out. <laughs> I have no potential. Like I, no, and, 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 and I'm, I'm, you know, much closer to 50 than I would like to talk about. So my dream of being an English Premier League soccer player, probably not gonna happen, right? Um, other people pick this other line over here around pay and potential, um, but they have no passion. Right. So they're really good at their job and it pays well, but they're not excited about it. Okay. Those people we call nine to fivers and I love them. They're great. I'm, I'm really excited that they're part of our industry, um, but they have no, they bring no passion. And so they're, they're mostly working to live and then they leave. Right. Um, there are other people that pick this bottom line, potential and passion. They're good at something. They're passionate about it, but it doesn't pay well. Those people, we call them missionaries, we call them teachers, we call them conference organizers. So I want to pause for just a second. I don't want to say thank you to Molly and Theo and Ralph and all the other conference organizers that are involved in, in this particular uh, conference. Um, so wherever you are, give them a little bit of a round of applause and just say thank you for organizing the conference because they're not making a whole bunch of money on this. <laughs> Right. Them as conference organizers, this is a, uh, an exercise of potential. They're very good at it and passion that they love it. Right. Um, so my goal in showing this triangle here is not to pick one of the sides, but I want to be there in the middle. Right. And I want this middle circle to be as big as it possibly can. And the contract that I set with my management chain is I say, look, I'm going to do stuff that I am really good at. I've got a lot of potential. 
I'm going to do stuff that I am very passionate about. And I'm going to align all of that to the North Star of the company, going back to that company mission. And I'm in as long as I'm doing stuff that I'm good at, that is that that I'm passionate about, that drives to the mission of the company, the organization, to the team, and I'm making sure that my team follows that mission and 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 so on. By goodness, you better pay me. And you better pay me well. <laughs> so that is my contract with my management. And that is also the contract that I set with the, the people that work for me is I'm going to make sure that they are doing stuff that they are uh, very good at, very passionate about, and is aligned to the company. And I'll make sure they get paid. So enable leaders. Focus on hiring diversity of thought and define and adhere to your team's North Star. That is leadership. And regardless of whether you're in a digital age, a physical age, it doesn't matter. That is leadership. And that is going to help you be successful. So with that, feel free to reach out, uh, Josh Holmes. Um, it's actually, and actually I normally have this on the slide here. I'll go ahead and just put it right here. Uh, Josh dot at Microsoft.com. And so um, if you have any questions or if you're interested in coming into work for me um, as a principal level developer, feel free to reach out josh.holmes at microsoft.com. On Twitter, I am Josh Holmes and on my blog is joshholmes.com, uh, my poorly neglected blog, um, but there it is. So with that, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, and I think we have a few questions. I've seen a few of them pop up, uh, but I'm gonna kiss, kick over to, uh, to Brian and uh, find out what those are. Josh, absolutely super. Thanks so much. Um, certainly passion and, and purpose. And, and we're sorry we couldn't help you on the pay side with this this particular talk. <laughs> but um, really use, love your use of quotes. Um, big fan of, of busting myths as an approach to, to better understanding. And um, yeah, there's so many magic formulas out there. Uh, Henry Mintzberg, who I like a lot, says the only only guaranteed result of any formula for managing is is failure. So I think mm -hmm. uh, you capture that well. We do have yeah. some great yeah, questions. Yeah. I, actually. I, I, I tell people I'm not any smarter than anybody else. I've just made a whole lot more mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it, isn't, isn't it recognizing and the ability to learn from them um, yes. is, is the critical thing. We have some great questions, so I'll go straight to them. Um, and I think your diversity of thought idea, I think it really hammered home the diversity and inclusion piece. Uh, one question was, how do you seek out diversity in the initial hiring stage? So how do I seek out diversity in the initial hiring uh, stage? Uh, so the first thing that I do personally is I cast a very wide net. So when I put a, a, a job posting up, um, in fact, I, you know, the, the job posting I put up, I put up uh, about two weeks ago. And um, I'm going to leave that up for probably two solid months. And I'm going to go recruit in a whole bunch of different places. So obviously, at Microsoft, we have the luxury of being able to recruit at MIT and Harvard and those kind of uh, 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 colleges. But I'm also going to be looking at historically Black universities. I'm going to be looking um, in different countries. I'm going to be you know, really casting a very wide net. Um, and then as I'm interviewing people, um, I, I kind of have many interviews where um, interview loops where, you know, I'll, I'll take three or four or five people that all come from a very similar background and I'll do a set of interviews and I'll narrow it down to one or two of those so that I don't end up with five people with the exact same background and same thoughts as, um, as everybody else in the interview loop. Um, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to get to that point where I've got that, that diverse slate of people coming into the interview loop. Um, and then we work very hard at, you know, what is it that we actually need right now, right? Um, so if you think about vehicles, there are sports cars, there are pickup trucks, there are, you know, all different types of, you know, people movers and, and so on. Um, you wouldn't take your drag racing funny car to the grocery store, but it is better in a drag race, right? You wouldn't drag race your people mover. You could, but it wouldn't be very effective. 
So I'm always looking for what is it that we actually need? And then where am I going to go look for that? And I cast as wide of a net as I can. And I just, it's just patience from that point on. Um, I, I, I really need somebody in this job, but I'm going to take my time and I'm going to go find the right set of candidates to bring into the loop. I don't know if I answered the question or danced around it. <laughs> no, no, it's brilliant to know in terms of the awareness of the channels, the diversity approaches and, and, and the patience and, and just the general understanding in terms of your approach. Um, a question drawing on your, your Irish US experience was a notable difference in, in, in managerial styles or leadership styles across the two countries, um, whether you noticed anything. So I'll actually talk a little bit more uh, kind of a higher general level. Um, and that is um, in the US. I mean, the U.S. is a, is, is a ginormous country. Um, it's kind of hard to fathom how big of a country it is. Um, the easiest way to explain this was when I was living in Michigan and my parents were living in uh, Arkansas. And so this is a straight up and down, not even a diagonal across the country. Um, it was uh, 16 hours for my mother to drive up to come visit us. And, 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 and she would come babysit my kids. So imagine importing your babysitter for your children from Mallorca. Like, <laughs> so um, that was uh, the scale of it. But with that scale, um, you know, becomes a lot of different nuances in the different cultures. But in general, the U.S. tends to be very transactional. It's what, what have you done for me lately and what price can I give you, you know, for, for this good or this service, et cetera. Um, Ireland tended to be much more relationship-based oriented. So it was a really, you know, I called it a relationship-based economy. Um, it was, it was far more about the relationship that you had with somebody else and that trust that you had with somebody else. And so um, managers in America, tend to focus on the transactional and the hierarchical leadership. Managers in Ireland do a little more of what I've been preaching a little bit, which is they develop that relationship. And it's really, it's about that trust and, and the relationship in the team versus, you know, um, uh, the, well, I'm paying you, therefore go do this. Um, and so, you know, and, and a lot of that can be uh, seen by, in the US, it's rare for, not rare, more rare <laughs> for a um, for a manager to go out with drinks with the team, right? It, it's considered improper, and so they don't go do that. And in in Ireland, no, it'd be weird if the manager wasn't going out for the drink ups as well, right? So much more focused on the relationship, much more focused on trust than than many U.S. companies. So that's a broad generality. Yeah, no, and I, I think it holds true, particularly when Irish firms are, are, are exporting and moving out of Ireland, that relationship can be a differentiator for them in, in terms of the way they approach things and pe how people recognize them. Um, question here about narcissistic leaders. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if I could say the word. Um, it's a current buzzword. What would the coping strategies be for working with such people? Um, so I've actually, I've had, I've had quite a few um, uh, narcissists as managers in the past, and some of them are absolutely fantastic and wonderful human beings, um, and that's okay, right? You know, the, the so think about narcissistic. Narcissistic means that they want the attention, they want that spotlight, they you know, etc., and um, uh, and they 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 need the glory, right? They need it to be circling around them, All right? Well. What you need to do to work with somebody who needs that and craves that because they feel empty if they're not getting that um, that, that glory and that, that center of attention um, is, you know, figure out what is it that is going to give them the, the attention for doing the right things, right? And so um, if they're bragging on themselves, ignore them, right? If they're bragging on their team and talking about how great their team is doing, Give them all the praise and attention. Wow, Brian, you did such a great job leading your team. That's why they were able to accomplish this thing that you're bragging about. And all of a sudden, oh, well, maybe I'll brag about my team more, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and, and, and if you, if you, you know, it, it's subtle, it's Pavlovian uh, uh, training them over and over and over and over again. Um, 
you know, that unfortunately that is the way to do it. Um, and it takes time and it's frustrating because they're constantly trying to claim credit for things that, you know, their team did that they didn't necessarily do. And so, uh, you know, by uh, ignoring them and, and, and unfortunately you kind of have to get the entire company to start doing that um, or you leave and you go somewhere else. Um, it is one of the wonderful parts about our, our current economy is that it is not terribly hard to go find another job if you have to. Yeah, no, brilliant, R real practical advice there. Um, one question I have myself, and it's a little bit biased, um, we're introducing a new degree and um, business, uh, digital innovation and business. Um, and I suppose with a blue ocean sort of blank slate, what could or should universities be doing in this space that they're not doing now? Or maybe maybe you've seen an example somewhere that you'd say that that's what they should be doing in universities. Or what can we do to to enable better leaders of the future? All your caveats acknowledged about. Uh, it's a, it's it's a it's a really interesting challenge. Um, I mean, I, I I think about the things that um, that universities. Uh, you know, the most valuable thing that i've seen universities do is teach people how to problem solve and think and i mean the reality is especially in the technology world today um like i think about a, a you know digital leadership of some sort right and i think about any software tool that you introduce in year one of a three-year program is probably going to be obsolete by the time they graduate. <laughs> and so it's not about teaching them the tools. It's about teaching them how to, uh, how to think and how to problem solve and how to, um, how to scale, right? How to work together, how to collaborate, how to brainstorm, um, and all the digital tools are simply they're, they're, they're simply tools right and so um it's not about teaching them the tools it's about teaching them how to do the thinking um and so i, I it's actually it's, it's a really fascinating question that i'd love to and i'll give this uh, you know you have my email address there email me that question and let's have that conversation um in a lot more detail when i've had a little more time to think about it because offhand i'm i'm not uh coming up with clear and concise answers i'm just thinking about you know kind of at a high level um you know when when, when i get a brand new college graduate um you know from a you know a hot shot new um you know uh computer science degree and they come in and they're you know all bold and they've you know done all this stuff with all the programming step one is I have to unteach them all the programming stuff that they have learned because that's not actually what's important. What's important is have they learned object-oriented uh, uh, programming theory? Have they learned architectural patterns? Are they able to think at that higher level scale? And the programming languages themselves are syntax. Uh, they come and they go, right? And so if I get a new college a college graduate who's a really, really cracking Java developer, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give them a Ruby assignment and have them go program in a programming language that they've never seen before, <laughs> right? Um, and it's because I want to get them out of that comfort zone and see, are they able to apply what they, you know, how they think to this new problem area? So no, that's, that, that's brilliant. And I, I, I think I will engage if you don't mind, we can have an email yeah. back and forth on it. But um, I think oh, you're right. Wait, on sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, do, I do. I do have one other thing, though, we were quickly uh, just just hit me. Um, and this is something uh, John Dennehy, uh, you might know John Dennehy from uh, from Cork. Um, one of the things he told me that was one differentiator between Irish startups and, um, you know, startups in the UK said Irish startups, they look at their little bitty pond of Ireland and 4 million people and they realize that's not their market. And so they have to build for scale, for global scale, right out of the gate. UK startups oftentimes start with the UK as their market or San Francisco startups start up with San Francisco as their market. And then they don't know how to scale beyond that. And so as I'm thinking about your digital uh, leadership degree there, 
um, thinking about global scale and really how to understand global markets versus an Irish market. That's something important that you could teach people. Yeah, no, that's that definitely definitely something to, to think about. I think you're on, you're on message with both points, and I, I think we can jump in sometimes and go straight to, as you say, the, the coding or the technical or what the discipline says without the stepping back and saying, well, actually, how do you understand it? What does it mean? Um, conscious of the time, so what, what you've actually done today is enabled us maybe to stand back a little bit and understand what we mean. And um, I still don't give up the dream of being a premiership footballer yet. So um, there's, there's, you should cling on to those North Stars, even if they've, the light has faded away in the distance. Um, yes. But, but um, Josh, re really appreciate your time. Um, very insightful presentation and great to connect again. And, and thank you for, for and, and on behalf of the audience, thank you for engaging with us and, and answering those questions. Um, just before we wrap up, just to let people know, the next session is on at uh, five o'clock. Uh, Eric Weaver, CEO of Transparent Path. Um, but for now, my final thanks to Josh and to everyone for attending. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. An absolute pleasure. Cheers.